All right, everyone. Namaste. I'm Ashley Turner, psychotherapist and yoga teacher. I am back to talk about the neuroscience of calm, of how to wire your mind for calm. And one of the most important factors, of course, is shifting our entire body from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic. I think you guys are very familiar with that sympathetic being the fight or flight and the parasympathetic being rest and digest or tend and befriend response. But I want to go a little deeper into the neuroscience. So here's a simple model of the brain. The thumbnail is like the amygdala gland. The amygdala gland is a small gland about the size of a pea, I think, in the middle of your brain. And the amygdala gland is um, it's really responsible. It's called the alarm bell of the brain. And so it's like kicking into vigilance. It's looking for, for things to protect us from. So it's very useful for our survival. It's very useful for, um, that sort of primitive brain. But when the amygdala gland is overactive, we kick into a hypervigilant state, um, a chronic stress response or a chronic anxiety. So that's the amygdala gland. Now, if you wrap your fingers around that, this is a, a very primitive model of the brain. And here we have in the front, the prefrontal cortex, or you might think of the gray matter of the brain right here, frontal lobe of the brain. It's called the executor of the brain, governs our executive functioning, planning, um, assessing, receiving input from all the other parts of the brain. And it has the ability to downgrade any fear or mutiny, any unnecessary, um, uh, you know, symptoms or activation. So the prefrontal cortex can be very innovative, tries to see things from different perspectives. I like to think of it kind of like the CEO sitting at a, um, uh, you know, board meeting and you have the head of finance and the head of HR and the head of marketing and the head of production and everybody's giving their input. All the pieces of the brain are giving their input and the executor, the executive is sitting there saying, okay, let's discern, let's decide what we're going to pay attention to and what we're not going to pay attention to, what are facts and what are interpretations, right? But the amygdala is over here firing all the time. So interestingly, in anxiety, um, one of the neurotransmitters, so um, I would, um, let me back up. I want to finish the, this model of the brain. So you have the primitive, uh, sorry, primitive amygdala gland, then you have the prefrontal cortex, and then here would be the brain stem, which is really that primitive limbic system, um, almost unconscious, just animal instinct, right? And that's the, the fight or flight, rest or digest. So kicking us into that fight or flight. So one of the most important factors in what parts of the brain are firing is a neurotransmitter. There's so much to go into, but I'm just going to focus on one piece of the neurotransmitter, GABA. So GABA is known to be very low in conditions like epilepsy, chronic pain, and chronic anxiety. GABA runs very low. And when we're looking psycho therapeutically or psychopharmacologically, um, the psychopharmatropics, <laughs> the um, pharmaceuticals that we use, the category of pharmaceuticals that we use in part to affect levels of GABA are called the benzodiazepines, right? So if you're familiar with psychotropic medicine, benzodiazepines are used to increase and boost GABA levels. So what happens when GABA is increased, when there's more GABA, the, it begins to tone down the amygdala gland and it begins to turn on that prefrontal cortex. So what has been proven to be the most effective natural way to increase and boost GABA levels is strong levels of activity. So I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise to any of you that strong levels of physical activity, sustained physical activity um, are known to raise the levels of GABA in the brain, in our, bio, um, our biochemistry. So strong physical activity. Now I just wanna add one other piece. There was an incredible study done in 2007, specifically on how does yoga affect levels of GABA? 
And this came out of an earlier study. And I got a lot of this information from my dear friend, Heather Mason out of um, the UK. She runs the Minded Institute and um, she's an incredible scholar and um, yoga therapy teacher as well. Um, but she was turning me on to this uh, scientific study. So this study was done in 2007. Um, it was published by the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. Um, it's called Yoga Asana Sessions Increase Brain GABA Levels. So what happened was there was an earlier study done that found that yoga increased GABA levels, but they then criticized it and said, how do you know it was yoga and wasn't some other kind of activity, physical activity? So what they did was this second study where they had one control group that was doing walking and another control group that was doing Iyengar yoga. And the control group, so they, they, they measured the heart rates and the heart rates were even. So they got them walking at the same pace to boost their heart rate to a certain level and doing yoga at the same pace to boost their heart rate to the same level. So the heart rates were the same. In other words, the amount of exercise was pretty much the same. And what happened was the yoga control group increased significantly, significantly greater increase in GABA levels than the walking group. So this can tell us a few things, but um, the takeaway is that probably the combination of deep breathing and the yoga movements, the global movements in yoga, helped increase GABA levels more than the walking group. This is a great study again, 2007. I can, um, I'll try to pull up the link and put it in this, in the comments below. The study was called Yoga Asana Sessions Increase Brain GABA Levels. So what happens when GABA is released is that amygdala gland, the fear-based pathways are the amygdala gland actually, activity in the amygdala gland lessens, at least for a period of time. And um, GABA can in inhibit or activate the prefrontal cortex as well. So the takeaway is that particularly yoga practice can be even more helpful. Exercise in general, absolutely helpful. Yoga sessions can potentially be more helpful in increasing GABA levels, decreasing the activation of that amygdala gland, that, um, uh, that fight or flight kind of instinctual alarm bell of the brain. So um, highly recommend doing yoga practice. Also very deep breathing, deep breathing. I'm going to talk about this next week. Um, I'll get into a little bit of the respiratory and the science of breath, but GABA levels increased. Now there's one caveat that I want to leave you with, which is that those levels of raised GABA lasted, were seen to last about eight days. So eventually those levels of GABA came down. Takeaway, you want to do your yoga practice at least twice a week. If you're a therapist, coach, holistic, you know, wellness practitioner, you want to emphasize to your clients and students that they are practicing at least twice a week so that you're not hitting that eight day mark where the GABA levels will then start to decrease. So twice a week, highly, highly recommended. Um, increase those GABA levels, reduce that amygdala gland, wire yourself for a calmer brain, affect brain chemistry naturally, and enjoy. I would love to hear your comments, your suggestions. Um, it's also good for those of you that are, are therapists or yoga teachers, it's really helpful to have a little bit of the science and even have some links to scientific studies so that you can speak to those skeptics and you can really teach from a place of competence and um, feeling like you know what the F you're talking about. And oh, this is grounded in science. This, this is not just esoteric um, you know, assumptions or projections. There's a lot of science that's catching up to this. So I wanna encourage you to do your own you know, firsthand research to seek it out and just weave in a little bit of these teachings, one little nugget here or there in class can do wonders to help people understand why this practice is effective and also to motivate them to keep practicing. That's a huge impetus that we want to motivate people to keep doing their practice. So you give them a little neuroscience, they're wiring some calm into their brain. It's having an effect on their neurotransmitters. They're increasing their GABA, they're decreasing their amygdala gland. 
super helpful. All right, hopefully this brain model was helpful. I wanna hear what your questions are, comments, suggestions, and I will see you next time. Namaste, thank you.